Hello, hello, and welcome on 139th Splitne Urice, or Web Hours, so called Web Hours. Uh, my name is Matea, Matea Veric Bruncic, and I will be your host today. I usually forget to introduce myself, so please, for everyone, listen, Matea, nice to meet you. Well, um, Usually I try to make an intro with uh, some interesting facts about the numbers because uh, 139 is a very interesting number. Let's say it's 34th in the, in the line or, or in the series of prime, prime numbers. I know that you didn't know that. And uh, I didn't uh, have time to dig up any, any dirt on this day. Uh, in history, so maybe I should start with introducing our guest today, so you won't uh, waste your time and you can go faster back to your net Netflix binging. Uh, well, today is with us. Uh, today with us is Tomasz Bratanic. He is a foremost a data explorer. He knows data inside out. Okay. He is into graph databases, and today he will re reveal all the last mysteries of graph da databases that are with us for 40 years or 50 years and more. And he will show us in a practical example uh, how to utilize them or how to uh, make them sexy and useful. Well, about Tomas, uh, what else can I say? I, I told you that he is a freelancer. Uh, he's into graphs, he's into uh, NLP, and he likes to write. So if you're interested, you can find him on Medium. I, I, I heard that maybe this is his second home, but uh, I leave it to you to check it out. And today, uh, he will guide us through network analysis of movie scripts or books, whichever you prefer. I prefer books. Um, but I leave it up to you to decide which part of the lecture to follow, but I suggest you listen to all of it, okay? Uh, without further ado, no, wait a minute. You can find us and follow us on all social media, except TikTok, I think, we're not there yet, but you can find us on web, uh, www.hmb.si. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, you name it. Uh, and maybe soon on TikTok, if we find a volunteer who will be willing to um, post stuff there. Okay, now, without further ado, Tomasz, the floor is yours. Okay, so I, I have to disappoint you a little bit, because <laughs> uh, I won't present all the secrets and mysteries of graphs and graph databases, but I will show you like a nice uh, practical example how to combine uh, NLP, basically text processing, and uh, graphs. Because mm, like uh, here you see it, because Matthias said movie scripts or books, but it's basically the concept is the same. Basically we start with some text and we construct uh, a network out of it. Uh, so a little bit about myself, even though Matea made a nice intro. Mm, basically, here's just some links if you want to reach me after the <clears throat> presentation, if you got some feedback, questions, um, anything, you can reach me on, uh, on the following links. Um, and yeah, maybe uh, it's best if I don't bore you too much and just uh, dive right into it. Uh, so like the first um, step is usually, because like usually when you say to a person a graph, they think about line charts or bar charts or stuff like that. But in the cons uh, context of networks, basically a graph uh, consists of nodes I don't know, can you see my mouse? Uh, yes. Yes, yes, you can see. Uh -huh. So basically, nodes are the bubbles, and then uh, those bubbles have uh, relationships between them, right? So this is a graph mm, um, uh, that's uh, basically a little bit different than like what you might be uh, used to. 
like put on tables, it's a little bit of a mind chip to like a jump in thinking about uh, data because uh, obviously you could represent this data as a table as well. Uh, it's not a big stretch to imagine how you do it. Uh, but uh, with graphs, like uh, you are basically the idea is that you are most more focused on actual relationships between uh, entities or nodes in the network and basically you have some um, specialized tools called graph algorithms or maybe also uh, more fancy graph neural networks that leverage those uh, relationships and come up with some cool uh, tools to help you understand and analyze um, data sets. Uh, just a quick um, note, basically you will see that people usually use network or graph like interchangeably because, uh, and I, I do it the same, but like in theory, uh, uh, like I would say that a graph is like a mathematical language to describe a network. So basically graph is like a mathematical language and then the network is the actual um, instance of data set because like for example you can think of a network it's like a social network <clears throat> where you've got like bunch of people and links between them right so if you think of facebook or like any like the first thing that at least to me comes to mind is like social media platforms so basically you're the person let's say in europe and hopefully you've got some friends in Europe as well, <laughs> but since this is a marketing image, uh, you've got friends all over the world. Uh, or basically what you can also represent uh, as entities and relationships, or not as, as and the relationships. If you're like Python developer, you might be familiar with pandas. And here you can see uh, dependencies between models, right? So again, each model, model is a node, and then you've got dependencies between um, those models, right? And the nice thing, like the how what they will like classical uh, pitch to graph uh, would be like, uh, let's say, if uh, we somehow corrupt this model, like the pandas called array sparse like how will the corruption spread through the network so which are the models that will be affected right? so this could be very useful also for from like a security perspective and uh, there are like lots of uh, use cases but like the underlying thing is like that with networks you're always dealing with some nodes mm, and uh, relationships, so bubbles and points. I like to call for the like. I don't know if like is a, even a, a, a word in English, but for the layman, in layman terms, a network is basically bubbles and some points between those bubbles. And uh, this brings us to like today's topic, which are co-occurrence networks, so this is basically nothing fancy, but it's basically the co-occurrence means that uh, it has to do with how we come up uh, with those relationships, because here is basically one of the most more famous uh, co-occurrence network, it's from the Game of Thrones book one uh, social net, and basically it's, uh, you've got characters and and the, and the relationships between those characters and you can see that um, the more two characters interacted right the wider the relationship is and then like when you're doing a nice blog post you you make it a little bit pretty so i don't know which font he used to make fancy like uh, names <laughs> but um, uh, basically, this is like one of the first examples of co-occurrence networks uh, derived from a book uh, that was made by, by Andrew, I don't remember his name, but he's like the professor at somewhere, I don't know. 
<laughs> but basically he's got if you're interested in game of thrones um like a couple of years ago it was cool uh you've got the network you basically just type in network of thrones uh, into google and you'll find um, co-occurrence networks for all the books and all the uh tv shows tv seasons as well but like back to the co-occurrence networks you have got like a definition so a co-occurrence network in text is a collection of interconnected entities so that means nodes and relationships where the relationship is based on the paired presence within a specified unit of text so uh, the co-occurrence here basically defines how we construct those relationships because uh, they, they are not like implicit or explicitly defined anywhere right so we kind of have to come up with how we will construct those relationships and Andrew uh, came up with a very simple yet very powerful um, like strategy and it's basically if two entities or like in this case two characters a pair of characters is present within uh 15 words uh, we assume that they have interacted and then uh, the more they interacted we also store the basically the count of those interactions uh, in the relationship so for those of you that have some experience with graphs basically we are de dealing with a weighted graph where uh, basically the weight of the relationship um, indicate how many interactions two characters ha had or have so basically i wanted to reproduce what andrew did by myself and i kind of laid out all the steps that you need to do along the way uh, to come up uh, with such nice visualizations so basically the first um, step is obviously identify all the entities and you can do that uh, basically um, with using NLP so like named entity recognition uh, models or if you know what you're looking for you can also use um, <clears throat> like a text pattern matching um, functions uh, but we'll get to the more we'll get to that uh, later and also uh, even before uh, you uh, you go into uh, identifying entities you want to do the co-reference resolution uh, I got it here so we'll get to there so let's I will just go quickly over the steps and then I, uh, we will go uh, in detail over each step what does it mean um, so basically so after you uh -huh. if i may i would like to invite our uh, guest or uh, not guest sorry uh, our um, people who are watching the stream to post maybe questions into comments on youtube or facebook and we can ask you the questions after you explain everything i mean you can also ask me in, in uh, between uh, it doesn't have to wait till the end uh, if it's relevant, right? But uh, let's give let, let's give them enough time to Google everything and go to <laughs> Wikipedia and refresh their uh, memory. Okay. <laughs> thanks for thanks for. Uh, so basically, after the, uh, we identified the entities, we have to define the co-occurrence event. So in the previous example, I said that basically entity, a pair of entities appeared within X word. It was 15 in that specific example. But it could be also that if two entities appear in the same sentence, they are somehow related, or if they appear in the same cell, uh, paragraph or whatever, you can define that as uh, those two entities interact uh, between each other and then uh, finally you just store the, the number of interaction or then basically the count of co-occurrences as a relationship between entities um, and that's it you've got you've constructed uh, a weighted co-occurrence network between uh, uh, entities but so that's like 
high level. And now let's uh, take a look at more um, technical, like what do you do at, at each step. Uh, so as I mentioned, the first step is usually, like at least when you're dealing with books, uh, is the code FNSS solution. Like with the movie scripts, you don't really have to do this, um, but with books, you need to. So basically, uh, in simple terms, code FNSS solution is uh, just uh, changing pronouns to the referred persons or organizations. So here we've got, uh, uh, like an example, is Anna is a graduate student at UT Dallas. She loves working in blah, blah, blah. And then basically the pronoun is she. It refers to Anna. And you just uh, replace she with Anna, right? So it's Anna loves working in NLP. Anna's hobbies include blogging, dancing, and singing. Uh, you've got, uh, there are some open source, uh, library is available, so you don't have to do it yourself. It's usually um, uh, with uh, deep learning uh, models. Uh, and uh, basically, there are a couple out there. Uh, and uh, you can spin it up in a couple lines of code and get started. So after you basically do the pre-processing, you go and uh, identify um, entities, as I mentioned. And uh, again, you like here, you've got uh, uh, lots of options. Uh, first of all, you can decide which entities do you want to recognize? Is it only persons? Uh, uh, does it have to be, can it be like organizations or like, it could also be like events or like abstract concepts? It's up to you, right? Uh, the most basic um, approach is to just identify people or the persons and go with that. And basically, you can use uh, named entity recognition. Uh, again, um, there are a bunch of uh, NLP libraries out there with pre-trained models. You just kind of have to pick the best that suits your text. Or in some specific cases, at least with books, you can use a simple pattern matching. Mm, because, for example, lots of like famous books have wiki fan pages, or fandom pages. And basically, you've got a, a collection of all the characters that appear in the book. Usually, uh, at least for Harry Potter, I've also seen it's basically uh, chapter by chapter. So you've got actually a list of characters in each chapter. <laughs> so basically all of the work is done or most of the work is done. Uh, you just have to uh, do entity disambiguation, which is something that you will always have to do no matter what. And it's basically the most, uh, the hardest, but the most important step as well. Um, because like here, uh, we've got, uh, in case you are a Harry Potter fan, or maybe you don't even have to be a fan, but basically Harry, right, can be referred to by many names. Sometimes it's by first name, sometimes it's by last name, sometimes it's by first and last name, sometimes it's the boy who lived, right, sometimes it's the chosen one. And you have to uh, realize that basically all those for the, uh, names refer to the same person. So, and you can, you do that through entity disambiguation. Uh, and uh, I've also seen that it's called character name clustering. So basically you find a group of uh, names that refer to the same entities. I've also added just for fun, uh, one example for, from Game of Thrones. And uh, again, uh, for the entity disambiguation, you can use external sources because here, uh, for Harry Potter, <laughs> luckily for us, uh, you've got his aliases, right? So he's the boy who lived the undesirable number one, Lightning. Um, 
or you can also use entity linking models but maybe for books the it's this is not so relevant mm, uh, maybe entity linking models are more relevant for news like news type of text <clears throat> where the, there are um, how you say more like public known or like most like celebrities are now uh, are mentioned which are which have an entry in Wikipedia because like probably not all characters in Harry Potter have an entry in Wikipedia but like let's say all senators in at least in America have an entry in Wikipedia right so it's um, kind of a I, I have to say what a shame what a shame <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean you can edit Wikipedia <laughs> if you want and add, add every single at least like you can start with like Slovenian, I don't know, activist. <laughs> oh look at the time. You should be yeah. <laughs> uh, but like entity linking models, usually they are like end to end NLP models. Uh, so they combine the entity recognition and entity linking. And entity linking is basically um, mapping the entity to a target knowledge base. And um, like for news type uh, entities, the most uh, uh, commonly used is Wikipedia. So basically here in this example, you can see that Paris is the capital of France, right? <clears throat> and it says Paris uh, is a location and so it kind of knows that we're not talking about Paris Hilton, but still it has to decide between Paris in Arkansas and Paris in France, right? And uh, some magic happens under the hood and hopefully um, it maps to the correct Paris. And also like France, it could be like France, right? <laughs> Slovenian. It's not France, appreciated, <laughs> but it's France, right? Uh, and they are like end to end models uh, that uh, map entities to target knowledge base. And basically, you can use, um, once you get uh, the Wikipedia ID, right? You can use Wikipedia ID for entity disambiguation. And uh, that's uh, quite commonly used in uh, lots of uh, text um, processing. Not so much for the books, but like more for the news. And like I said, it's also really prevalent in biomedical um, domain where you can map text to specific genes, right? Uh, and uh, diseases and stuff like that. But uh, okay, so here I've got an example. Um, so what if uh, someone is referred by only the last name, or it could be also the first name? And here we got Potter. I mean, if you read Harry Potter, I mean, you probably know that it's Harry Potter, right? Because he's the main character. But we can pretend that we don't know um, that it's Harry Potter. It would be James or Lily, right? <clears throat> and uh, you've got like a couple of options. You can pray to God <laughs> that entity linking model works correctly. <laughs> but <laughs> it usually does not. Uh, or basically what I did in the example, because if you see, I've shown a couple of Harry Potter uh, examples. And at the end, I will show you how I constructed basically a Harry Potter co-occurrence uh, network. What I actually did is uh, I looked at uh, neighboring entities. And I found, uh, I, I searched for which of the, these three, basically which of the entities with the same last name is closest to the given text, right? So if uh, like a text before, uh, a sentence before the sentence after Harry Potter is mentioned, I assume basically that uh, this last name also uh, mentions Harry Potter. So it's like a simple, um, text processing technique, but uh, you will have to uh, do so something. You have to come up, maybe, maybe I mean, still some ideas to come up with some own logic, but 
the end uh, should be the same. Like you always want to uh, disambiguate entities uh, because uh, in order for the concurrence network to be of any use, any real world entity should be represented as a single node in the network. So if you have multiple um, nodes representing Harry Potter, then kind of the whole point of network uh, goes away and it's not uh, really useful. So once you've done basically the hard part uh, is uh, named entity recognition and in this configuration. Uh, now you can simply define a co-occurrence event and as I mentioned before, um, the professor that did uh, the Game of Thrones um, analysis, he used uh, if uh, two entities appeared within uh, 15 words of one another, then we assume that they interacted with one another. <clears throat> but you can have different co-occurrence event definitions. And here, uh, basically, uh, he also mentioned like, so what are like the scenarios where two, like a pair of entities uh, co-occur within X or like within a specific unit of text. And it could be two characters appearing together in the same location, <coughs> two characters in conversation, but it could also be like, uh, one character talking about a, uh, another one that's not here, right? So b basically, you could be trash talking <laughs> about someone behind his back, right? But uh, the, uh, in this case, right, it's gonna the, uh, it's gonna assume that um, the interaction was, ma was made between the two. Like you can go deeper. <laughs> and then uh, basically uh, differentiate between spoken text and uh, setting up the scene. Um, uh, but uh, that's beyond the scope of um, today's lecture. But basically you can, you can basically you're only limited by your imagination and uh, technical skills. <laughs> uh, so, uh -huh. One thing is funny here, uh, if you go back to uh, back one slide, so we are mentioning characters and we have words and sentences and probably some characters there as well, right? The characters are yeah. people. So if you, you, if you would have to disamb, disamb, uh, that here, <laughs> there would be some challenges, right? Uh, uh, they're not named entities, yeah, uh, not named entities. But if you have to distinguish between character as in character as a yeah, I know what you mean. Pa yeah. <laughs> part of string and uh, character as basically uh, a per, uh, like a person appearing like a letter, yeah, and a like yeah, a yeah, yeah. person, yeah. Uh, yeah, I maybe just, it could be. We need to disambiguate. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that I'm listening very intently. Yeah. So please continue. <laughs> disambiguate. Yeah, but it should maybe. His characters here is basically um, uh, a character in a movie or a book or whatever. So basically, once you apply all those steps, uh, you come up uh, with this kind of network. So it's basically a coconut network where the relationships represent um, basically that two uh, entities appear together. I also used uh, within uh, 15 words. So basically the co-occurrence event is 15 words. And as you would imagine, Harry Potter is more or less in the center of the network. And uh, then you've got Dumbledore, uh, Weasley and Dursley and a, a bunch of cool people <laughs> around. And here you can also see the bad guys, right? So it's Draco and Goyle, right? I, I'm not like a Potter expert, but I feel like that's um, uh, uh, accurate enough. The only interesting thing is that Hermione is closer to Draco than Harry. But it seems like that she she's uh, but it's not like that she's closer to the like she's closer to this group, so she's kind of 
like a bridge uh, from Harry Potter to the upper left um, group of people. The so I, uh-huh. Could it be that all the bad guys get the good girls? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. you have to tell me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, no. Maybe they talk about her a lot, right? Yeah, here in this case, they don't actually have to uh, get her. It's just that she's on people's mind, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on, on this uh, note, I would like to ask you a question. We have a question on YouTube, maybe two even. Um, so the the Trash peep metal, uh, peep, you know, what it stands for. Uh, the first question is, could network of interactions somewhat be used to predict outcome of the books or the movies? So I imagine if you do, if you, you would do like analysis of uh, the script, right? Uh, mm-hmm. in a, on a time series, and then you can see which characters appear in which episode, and then suddenly you see who's that. <laughs> yeah, actually... You could. Some students in Germany actually did that because uh, with graphs, time series are a bit tricky, <clears throat> but you could take like a window. So uh, let's say, uh, I think I, didn't, I think they used TV shows, but basically you construct a co network like from the first season of Game of Thrones. Uh, they calculated some network features, like how many uh, degrees or how many relationships each has, and some other uh, network features. And then they applied supervised <coughs> training, basically, where they had labels who died uh, in the, I don't know, if it may be in the same season. Yeah, it, no, it, or it could be in the next, because you're predicting the next one. So it was take the features from the first season. Uh, and apply it on uh, uh, basically that from the second season and train the model on a couple of seasons and then perhaps take uh, features from season five and predict that uh, in on season six, right? So that's actually uh, what some students in uh, Germany actually did. Interesting. So I, I guess we could do the same or similar to the books. It's- just up to the creativity of the researcher who has to code everything, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just depends. Because, uh, like, you need, uh, how to say, a big enough training data set, right? Because if you want to do supervised machine learning, at least, like, somewhat reasonable data set and uh, at least somewhat connected uh, network. Uh, yeah, but you can... Uh, apply you can do it anything so you can use like in the harry potter example you can do first book and then look at people i don't know people don't really die in harry potter book um, but you could uh, perhaps uh, predict new links like who who becomes friends like in the next season or whatever now to the second question which is related in a way uh, related to this slide and what you told us right now so the same trash peep metal uh, uh, guy asks, how do you verify that entity disambiguation worked as expected? Are there any shortcuts besides verifying everything manually? Yeah, uh, the, I mean, it's manual labor, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, there are, I mean, you could come up with some uh, scripts uh, right, uh, and do some rule-based uh, validation just so you don't have to do everything manual because ideally, for example, here you can see that you shouldn't really have entities with a single name, although they might happen, but usually not. Uh, uh, but yeah, more or less it's, uh, uh, how to say, uh, manual manual uh, work and you need to be somewhat uh, a domain expert or subject matter uh, expert. <laughs> yeah. it is some, some things uh, just can't be automated unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so any other questions? Uh, 
Not for now. Uh -huh. I have plenty, but I'll, I'll uh, okay. keep them for the end. Yeah. So basically, now that we've got ourselves a network, we can start applying uh, network analysis or uh, graph algorithms on top of it, right? And uh, the first uh, algorithm that I applied was PageRank. So PageRank is kind of famous from Google for uh, evaluating which uh, website is the most important. If you do any CEO right, you want to do, you know that backlinking and page rank is important. But uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, basically with graphs, you can model whatever you want, right? The bubbles can be whatever you want and the relationships can represent also whatever you want. Uh, and so the algorithms are domain agnostic. And here in this example, I ran PageRank, and you can see that it identified that Harry Potter is the most important uh, person uh, in the book, followed by Ronald Weasley and Hermione, and then closely following is Hagrid, right? So this is a really, because you can see like the power of this approach is at no point did we ever gave it any um, like training data or any uh, supervised uh, step? This is all unsupervised. I never decided what I want to get out, right? The only thing I decided was the co current event. So, what defines an interaction? <coughs> and uh, that's everything uh, that I uh, defined. And the the network itself tells me that basically Harry Potter is the most important uh, person, obviously. And basically, the, the the identifying the most important nodes in the graph uh, is called centrality. So basically, centrality algorithms are used to define the most central or important or maybe influential nodes in the graph. There are a couple of other um, metrics as well, but perhaps page rank is the most uh, famous one. And then what you can also do is apply community detection on top of it. So basically community detection is used to find uh, groups of nodes that are tightly uh, knit or interconnected together. <clears throat> and here I basically colored uh, nodes based on their community belonging. <clears throat> and again, this is uh, unsupervised, uh, unsupervised clustering, perhaps uh, you're more, more familiar with clustering because clustering and community detection is basically the same. Uh, but uh, like I, I like to, uh, use community detection because uh, clustering could be used in like a software architecture. So community detection is more um, descriptional. And here you can see interesting as well, we, we haven't told it, um, basically we didn't give it any example or told it what to do. And it, uh, and it decided, the, the algorithm decided Harry Potter, Weasley, Hermione and Hagrid and Dumbledore, but also Sirius Black are in the same community, right? So I find that like with such a simple approach, we've basically reduced the whole book to one nice uh, visualization and actually got quite cool results, right? I, uh, the only one that I wasn't really happy about is that the uh, long Neville Longbottom is kind of <laughs> French with Draco, right? But uh, uh, it's not perfect, but it is like good enough, for just like the most simple approach uh, that you can think of. Uh, we've got uh, really cool results. And like if I and you can see it's uh, very similar to the Game of Thrones one that I showed before. Basically, I would have to <coughs> change the font 
font of the captions, make it a little bit pretty, and then I could go and uh, pitch it, or maybe publish it in a magazine. <laughs> uh, but you can see basically um, what I wanted to show you uh, here is basically that such a simple um, approach to text can be uh, uh, can uh, produce such powerful uh, results and I've also done some couple like uh, some other uh, um, data sets as well so here is example uh, from the matrix movie script I took the first uh, movie script uh, the movie script of the first movie of the matrix <coughs> and basically defined that uh, if two characters appear in the same scene, they have interacted between each other and basically just uh, did the same, uh, uh, did all the same steps. Uh, and uh, again, you can see that uh, here, I, I really like these results as well. Obviously, Neo, Trinity, and Morpheus are the most um, important um, characters. But uh, here I really liked uh, the community uh, detection results because here you can see that agent and lieutenant, so the bad guys, right, are purple. And then we have uh, all the guys that were on the ship with Morpheus <coughs> in yellow and one security guard, who knows who he is. But basically the people on the ship. And then we got Oracle and her, the gang in orange and again uh, this is all unsupervised right uh, we didn't tell it what to do it just did it uh, the magic by itself uh, and it produced a, a very cool result but obviously uh, you can apply this to whatever you want here for example we've got uh, entities in medical um, <coughs> in medical literature and how entities uh, co-occur between each other. Here, basically, I've used if two entities appear in the same article, they're related. Uh, but I won't bother with that. But I wanted to show you another uh, cool uh, co-occurrence network. It's basically ingredients in a recipe, right? So basically, your know, recipe is one section of text, <coughs> and ingredients are entities. Uh, in the text and then here in this example you can say if two uh, ingredients appear in the same uh, uh, in the same uh, recipe they are somehow related right uh, uh, you create relationships between it, the them uh, uh, run centrality and uh, apply community detection on top of it and you get uh, cool results like this because here for example you can see that uh, <laughs> sugar is the most widely used, but it's, uh, but here you can see like sugar, flour, egg, milk. <coughs> uh, so basically, people are baking all sorts of cool stuff. I feel like this is uh, an American uh, a data set of American uh, recipes because we got peanut butter, which is really prevalent here. But I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's so widely used in other cu cultures, but I've seen it mentioned every time, like in American cuisine. And I might be the biggest consum consumer of peanut butter here in Ptui region. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so maybe you've got some American genes, <laughs> or maybe you did, you contributed uh, recipes. The data set. Uh, no, I'm just I'm just consuming it. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, and here, though, like on the right side, you can see like onions, like tomato, potatoes, chicken, meat. Right. So if here we are more baking stuff, <coughs> here we've got like main dishes. Right. Um, uh, like I said, bacon, pork, chicken, onions, tomatoes, tomato sauce cheddar cheese, beef, and it's also uh, really uh, like uh, useful and like people have seen some uh, academic research papers basically, uh, <coughs> uh, how do you say, um, 
finding uh, like this uh, finding differences between different cuisines right so how does indian cuisine uh, differentiate like from the mediterranean or like scandinavian and uh, you can use this sort of approach and uh, find differences uh, but like uh, to not bore you uh, i mean uh, I, you can use this uh, networks, co-occurrence networks in uh, practice as well. It doesn't have to be just some nice uh, academic research and visualizations, right? For example, you could use uh, it to power your recommendations, right? Because if you know that like lots of recipes uh, <coughs> with tomato sauce also include onion, you could recommend onions uh, with when, when some people purchase uh, tomatoes, right? So here I went and take a look uh, uh, at uh, some recommendations by like a Slovenian vendor, and it doesn't seem like they in any way relate to uh, the 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 um, how I say the specific uh, items. So here in this example, we've got. Um, pepper right and then the first thing they recommend is toothpaste <laughs> so maybe they could use some inspiration and improve their recommendation uh, engines a little bit and kind of look like what goes together because very uh, very frequently used in the recommendation engines is basically using co-occurrence of products in a basket, right, which uh, products are basically commonly purchased together. So basically you take the basket as your uh, co-occurrence event and your entities are the uh, products and you create relationships between uh, which uh, <coughs> products are commonly co-purchased <coughs> and then you can use that to you power your uh, recommendation uh, engine, and that's actually widely used. Uh, widely used, but uh, so what? Like what's next? Because like co-occurrence networks are, at least from the NLP point of view, are a little bit a thing of the past. Although they are very powerful, they've been they are a bit outdated, and now like state of the art. NLP models can also extract the relationship uh, types. So instead of uh, using uh, NLP to only extract uh, entities, you can also use uh, NLP to extract relationships. <coughs> it's the field is called relation extraction, actually. So it's quite fitting um, to use it to to construct a knowledge graph. And here, basically, you can see that. Uh, uh, I've added an example, so uh, it's not that uh, like with the co-occurrence you would just know that Tyrion is somehow related to wine, but if you had uh, a trained uh, uh, NLP model, you, you would know that Tyrion actually drinks wine. So basically the relation extraction models are used to extract that type of relationship between entities, and this is also very very powerful because it allows you basically to process any type of text like uh, it's uh, very uh, heavily used in biomedicine uh, but you can also use it to process for example news right <clears throat> and you would know what's happening in the world who's getting married to whom who got who got who uh, which company went bankrupt whatever just by running uh, news to do uh, NLP pipeline. And then uh, uh, for the end, uh, a little bit of a, uh, how to say, shameless plug. <laughs> if you want to learn more, I'm actually writing a book about graph algorithms, and it's going to be also a chapter about NLP at the end. Um, uh, uh, it's in uh, it's called Manning Early Access Program. 
So that means that uh, you can buy it, even though that the, the, there are only five chapters um, released. But I am, uh, how do you say, hard working <laughs> and trying to get uh, and writing on the book so that uh, you can get it uh, like the full uh, release as soon as possible. And here I, I've got a, a promo code that you can use. Uh, it's 35% off, but it's actually the funny thing is, if I understand correctly, it's not only uh, discount on my book, but actually on any product uh, on Manning. So uh, you can use this code um, uh, to buy any book at discount if you want. Um, uh, yeah. And now, uh, any questions? Like I, I've, I've got um, basically the Harry Potter and also the the Matrix example. Uh, the code is available as Jupyter Notebook uh, on my GitHub. I also added a link to my Medium for the Harry Potter if you want to take a look at it. Um, so yeah, that's about it for the my, my site. And now for the question. Okay, ready, steady, go. Uh, let me, okay, put my fingers. Uh, we have one more question from our crowd. Uh, so the same uh, person who is intently listening uh, as well as I did. Uh, again, trash, I'll, I'll, I'll say the name because I'm not a shy person. So trash fucking metal. Is asking how about fraud protection in e-commerce business? I guess this could be one nice use case as well. Is graph uh, database like Neo4j fast enough to do that in real time on a big data set? Uh, so uh, I would say yes, <laughs> because you've just uh, listed the uh, how to say the main uh, selling points of Neo4j. So basically e-commerce, like I showed um, <coughs> the recommendation engine, right? Mm, because the thing is uh, that you can, uh, uh, how you say, if you need it to be real, really fast, you can pre-calculate these relationships, right? So at query time, the relationships are, are already available. You don't have to then um, uh, do all this uh, uh, heavy lifting at query time, right? But uh, here is basically just a, a, a simple example because nowadays people like to use graph neural networks <coughs> for the recommendations. But yeah, definitely. Uh, 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 e-commerce fraud detection uh, is definitely a use case uh, where you could use Neo4j. Uh, uh, maybe best if you take a look at their uh, white papers, because um, I don't know. But I know they've got some big companies um, that they work with. And basically, uh, when they had uh, the last um, the last uh, big uh, event of Neo4j, they actually showed a graph where they had a, a trillion relationship. So basically, thousand billion relationships, and they showed that it scales, right? Uh, so um, yeah, definitely, I would say that you can use Neo4j for production, real time problem. So we can give the, uh, a challenge to our, um, uh, I don't know how to say, Gladalti. So whoever viewers. is, viewers, thank you very much. Um, kids, try this at home. So use <laughs> the library, try to find something to analyze, to visualize. Uh, um, I have a question. So uh, today when I was uh, in my car and uh, going home, I was thinking about, um, you probably heard that if you know, I think like six people, you can you can go around the world, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. So these days I'm almost living in LinkedIn, um, uh, building the network, uh, figuring figuring out who posts what and how to uh, 
let's say, find interesting people or candidates, stuff like that. So I started thinking if there are tools, I didn't do any research, uh, how I could kind of analyze LinkedIn to see if I can, through my network, come around the world. So if I know someone who knows someone that is not in my network and then who knows someone, again, who's not in my network, but maybe comments on someone else's uh, post. I mean, uh, uh -huh. by network, you mean your direct relationships? Yeah, yeah, my connections, yeah, yeah. My mm. confirmed connections, uh, in a way. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, you can definitely do that, but uh, first, obviously, like uh, the the hard thing about data is you need to get <laughs> the data. Right? So if you could uh, scrape LinkedIn, mm. so it's not like I call LinkedIn and say, "Hey guys, <laughs> I would like to do a research." <laughs> May I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get the database of your people. It, like... It's for science. <laughs> it's for science. Yeah, I promise. <laughs> yeah, it's for science. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, you can see there is some like research, there is some like academic research of Facebook, <coughs> and uh, I uh, I think if I remember like the uh, the uh, how you say the longest path was like around five or six because usually uh, they say that um, the diameter is basically of the network so the longest uh, path or basically the yeah the longest shortest path between two persons is the diameter and it scales logarithmically, right? So one million is around six degrees and then uh, probably a billion is around nine. But that's just like, uh, how you say, a, a meta approximate, approximation, but uh, uh, basically it's uh, the diameter is really small because even like for the billion person, right, that's a lot. At most, you could be like seven or eight hops away. So oh, it's called okay. uh, it's called a uh, uh, small world. So there's hope for me to reach everyone <laughs> in this planet who's on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Eventually. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, one question related to, to data, right? So you took a uh, uh, Harry Potter book. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. uh, I know there are some uh, databases of books that um, are uh, open, not, not open source, but free, for you, free to use or free to analyze. But I remember from my academic times, the, the hardest part was usually, as you said, get, getting the data, right? So how do you how do you cope with that? I mean, when you do your freelancing uh, gigs, probably you get the data from companies, I imagine. Or... Yeah, yeah, that's it. But like for my articles, I have to go and dig deep, dig dig into it, right? Because, uh, like you said, I mean, that there's a lo there's lots of data available even copyrighted <laughs> data, you can find it on the internet, right? Uh, but if you want to publish a post, unfortunately, you can't use any copyright um, data set. But you can go like to Kegel and then uh, basically nowadays, the cool thing is that almost every organization has got like uh, uh, bulk downloads or their own API, which you can get uh, data uh, so basically, the world is going towards uh, open source, basically data. So you can uh, get almost any data uh, that you need. <coughs> and uh, if not, you can pay someone uh, to get it for you, right? And uh, luckily, uh, you can use free trials and stuff like that. <laughs> well, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. <laughs> Right. Yeah. No. yeah. Uh, did you ever use crowdsourcing for uh, gathering data? You said you, you can pay someone. Okay, you can get some research assistant or something like that. But you, could you use crowd crowdsourcing sourcing? So um, probably yeah. could you use it. Uh, to actually pay someone to do it, no. But like I said, you can use like uh, Wiki pages because you got like fandom pages. I've done some scraping uh, 
uh, or you can use like Wikipedia, Wikidata, it's called DB, DBpedia. There's like all sorts of uh, crowdsourced information that fans do it for you, right? Uh, and uh, sometimes it's available uh, as a nice CSV or whatever, and sometimes you gotta scrape it, right? Um, so that's about as much uh, as I've got uh, uh, experience with crowdsourced information. And obviously you can't rely 100% on it, but uh, better than nothing, right? We haven't touched the tools that you use. Okay, you you, you mentioned uh, um, uh, where is it? Jupyter no notebooks. So Jupyter definitely, right? So mm -hmm. I imagine Python I mean, and Python, other libraries, Python. yeah. But but do you have any any tools that can help you clean the data or pre-process the data, prepare it? Uh, you mentioned libraries, but I'm, I mean like tools. For example, uh, years ago I used Google Google Refine, or is it now Open Refine? I think it was Google's tool, but now it's open refine. Um, it's a, like a, it's a server that you can run locally and then you can import the data and then you can reconciliate it and you can link it to Wiki. So do you have any such tools in your arsenal that you would suggest for us to try out? Like, I mean, uh, I like Spacey. Uh, Spacey actually I've seen, they've got, if you type in Google, Spacey book NLP. Someone actually uh, did like a project that does most of the steps that I mentioned here uh, for you. So it does code reference, it does entity disambiguation of character. Uh, it's called, he calls it character name clustering. And uh, it does that automatically for you. So definitely, uh, I mean, uh, I would use this. Uh, I would recommend Spacey because it's easy to use. Um, and uh, nowadays you've also got some entity linking uh, models. <coughs> but like it uh, with NLP, as you might know, it, it really heavily depends on the domain, right? Um, so if you're doing news, you gotta use specific models. If you're doing books, you gotta use other models. If you're doing biomedicine, the first one, if you're doing, I don't know, uh, nuclear physics, it's a fifth one. So it's uh, uh, usually very domain specific um, tools. Okay. I have maybe two more questions or one question and one stupid remark. I'll, I'll start with the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so you. Um, you had some uh, graphs for Harry Potter, and then you had it for uh, Matrix, right? Yeah. But these are, for example, the, the works that we know about, are familiar with, and we know how to interpret them, right? But how do you interpret something that you don't know that good? So what does the graph tell you? What what do the rela relationship or, or relationships or groups tell you? How do you evaluate whether your graph uh, uh, show something useful. <clears throat> like here, for example, you could say, so, I mean, how do you evaluate if you don't know the domain? I mean, that's hard, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's okay. hard, but, because uh, you, you don't, you don't, you, you've got nothing to validate against, right? Uh, uh, but it could give you some clues what to look at, right? You can say, is Harry Potter the most important person? Mm, who knows? I like Harry, uh, Dumbledore, Weasley, and Granger uh, closely related because they are the same community. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. So it's not like, uh, uh, basically, you validate it. <laughs> it gives you hints. Uh, on your data and then and, and it, before like it's uh, you don't have prior knowledge to validate it so you need to get I don't know what's the opposite of prior knowledge after knowledge <laughs> to validate it. So you can explore unknown data like this and maybe you get you get a hint what might be going on and it's like a hypothesis or an insight that you can research further that, that's how yes. I imagine it. Okay. Yes exactly. Yeah. So it's not that uh, if you see uh, this uh, blue note, then for fact you'll claim that they belong together regardless, right? 
Sirius Black? No, <laughs> no, because like I said, then uh, you have to go and think about how you de 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 define the relationships as well, right? Because you can, uh, how you say, mani manipulate the graph. So instead of if I say, <coughs> if uh, the interaction is instead of 15 words, if it's 30 words or something like that, then uh, how different will the graph be, right? Obviously more connected. Or like if I somehow uh, exclude when people are talking about other people and only include uh, when like the set, the scene is set, right? So I know for, for certain they were physically together, not just uh, talking about each other, then I can say, so they are in the same location a lot of the time, right? Does that, what, and what does that mean? Who knows, right? Are they friends? Are they lovers? Do they want to kill each other? <laughs> right? If somebody is talking to someone, you don't know, right? But here is where uh, the relation extraction model comes in, right? So with the co-occurrence, you don't really know what's going on. But the relation extraction model helps you uh, define the types of relationships or the like semant give semantics relationships. So you can you would you would be able to differentiate if two persons are lo lovers or enemies, right? And this uh, this is basically the next uh, step of uh, NLP journey. I have an alternative if you're not up to this complex uh, game of relation extraction models and stuff like that. So you can always write an email. That's the stupid remark I wanted to, to make. <laughs> I was waiting for my moment, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can write to JK, JK Rowling and say, look, my graph shows that your characters are not connected as I want them to be. So please correct the book so the, the, your data will fit my model. Thanks. Uh, yeah. bye. I mean, uh, you know, as a data scientist, you can also fit your model to, uh, uh, or like change your model to fit your ideas, right? Because <laughs> that's like the true data scientist. You don't like the results, just basically uh, change your model to fit your uh, results. So any hypothesis you make is uh, accurate. <laughs> And you can boost your ego. So that's I Please feel like... don't do this. Okay, <laughs> you might you might do other things. Like right. You want to be scientist? Don't. That's the essence of data science, right? <laughs> so twisting data until it tells you what you want to hear. You yes. <laughs> uh, Tomas, I don't have any more questions from the crowd, so uh, I would like to thank you at this point, okay. and. Uh, I would like to again invite our dear beloved followers, subscribers to uh, check us out on the on the webs. So we have a website www.hmb.si. You can find us on Instagram, on Twitter. Also, you can find me and Tomas. No, Tomas and me on LinkedIn. You can follow us. You can uh, leave us a comment. You, you can, can also. Uh, how do you yeah. say uh, we can? Uh... Uh, conquer the world because like you wanted to reach everyone, right? Yeah, please so, help me reach everyone. So, so we need someone from Africa, we need someone from Japan, we need someone from uh, Siberia, because that's, that's how you do it with the networks. Like you just need one connection to far away uh, places, right? And then he can be your bridge into, let's say, Japan. Yeah, then I'll have to report on my weekly meetings. Oh, so you had like 50 new connections? Yeah, all over the place, all over the world. Why? <laughs> because I wanted to get around the world in 80 days. Yeah. <laughs> and I did it. <laughs> uh, okay, so before I forget, uh, check out Tomas. He's on LinkedIn, he's on GitHub, as you've seen. Uh, check out his uh, Medium uh, blog post and buy the book. <laughs> this one and all the next ones. Uh, I would also like to invite you to our Eshankor rally. Uh, the link will be posted in the comments, so you'll, you are invited to uh, join us and maybe have a word or two with Tomas when the ca cameras turn off, so you you won't be recorded. Uh, at this point, I would like to invite you again uh, after two weeks to join us and um, 
see another exciting journey into web uh, technologies, product management, design, you name it. Uh, until then, thank you, goodbye, and have fun. Bye.